to talk to you about being faithful with little. Um, I want to talk to you about it because it's a big deal to God. Jesus speaks powerfully into the faithfulness of the people of God and uh, what it yields in our life. Uh, there's such a wonderful scripture in Luke chapter 16, verse 10. It says, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. Come on. There's a promise there, isn't there? If you're faithful with a little, God's going to give you. Come on. What's he going to give you? Much. God's going to give you much. And um, I believe that there are many of you this, this year that have been praying different kinds of prayers. You've been saying, God, thank you for what you've done, but Lord, use it as a launch pad to take me into the much more that you have for me and for my family. Amen. And I want to speak to that this morning. There were three uh, key thoughts that the Lord has given me about being faithful uh, with little. Three key thoughts about faithfulness uh, regarding the things that are currently in your life. You know, you can't be faithful with what's not yours, right? You can only be in the sense that, you know, it's not your responsibility. It's not in your hand. It's not in your life. You can't be faithful with that. You can only be faithful with what's been put under your charge. <clears throat> so the first thought is, God wants you to be able to identify, come on, say identify, that's right, identify what is in your hand. God wants you to know what He has placed in your hand. Uh, phenomenal scripture is, um, about this exact thing is found in Exodus chapter 4, when Moses meets the Lord uh, in the burning bush, how many of you remember the story? Come on, wave at me just a little bit. Let me see how many of you know your Bibles. Hallelujah. Meets the Lord in the burning bush, and uh, a dialogue begins to unfold. Moses has been tending his father-in-law's sheep for 40 years. And the Lord then asks him, what is that in your hand? Do you think God didn't know what was in the hand of Moses? He knew what was in the hand of Moses. Moses needed to understand what was in the hand of Moses. And God does that with us when we pray. God often answers our prayer with a question. He'll come and he'll ask you a very important question that is a leading question that will get you to think about the thing he's addressing in the way he wants you to think about it. God, he's, he's a master question asker. He asked Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was, but Adam needed to understand where Adam was. If you don't know where you are, you won't know how to get to where God is telling you to go. Somebody calls you on the phone and they say to you, um, I'm lost. Uh, can you tell me how to get to your house? Because I don't know how to get there. I don't know this part of town. And the first question you're going to ask them is what? Where are you? Well, if you don't know where you are, you don't have an ability to get where you need to go. That's why God often wants us to know where we are. What is in your hand? He says to to, to Moses, and Moses said, a shepherd's staff. Wow. He doesn't just say a staff. He says a shepherd's staff. What God is getting at in this thing that he's trying to bring Moses' attention to is, you're holding on to the tool of your trade. He's a shepherd, and he uses his staff every day. He walks with it. He guards the sheep with it. He steadies his own pace with it. It's a staff that is familiar to him. He is skilled at, at wielding it. He has whittled shapes into it. 
His hand has smoothed the, 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 to the touch the staff that he has uh, been handling for 40 years. There are things that are in your hand that are very familiar to you right now. Your livelihood, your skill set, your gifting mix, your sphere of influence, and you're skilled at it. And you're, it's a human thing. It's a natural thing. It's, it's, a, it's an important thing. It's something that other people can look and go and say, you're amazing at that. Because you've, you've wielded it for some time in your profession, in, your, in the place where you have earned your income, where you applied your trade. And the Lord is addressing this with Moses. God could have done something else. God could have made another uh, kind of thing appear in the bush. If he can make fire burn in the bush, I think he could have provided a golden rod for Moses. But he didn't. He used what was already, come on now, follow me. He used what was already, hallelujah, what was already, where? In his hand. But because he was so used to it being in his hand, God needed to draw attention to it again. When you become familiar with that which is in your sphere, with that which is in your life, with that which you used to ply your trade with, you can begin to diminish what God wants to do with that familiar thing. You can begin to limit him. You can begin to despise it. You can begin to say, hey, but God, you know what? I have only got this. But God then says to Moses, cast it on the ground. Cast it on the ground. What's God saying to you this morning? He's saying to you, you need to cast your Thing that is in your hand, your trade, your ability, your skill, your thing that you are familiar with, that has been in your life, that is in your sphere, and you need to yield it to the presence of Almighty God. You need to put it in His hand, out of your hand into His hand, to not just let it go reluctantly, but passionately cast it down in the presence of the Lord. In doing so, a miracle took place when that happened. So he threw it down on the ground, and the Lord to told him, so Moses threw it down, and it turned into what? It turned into a snake. Why couldn't it have turned into a dove? Hallelujah. Or turned into some sweet kitten. You know what I'm saying? Something you felt endeared toward, or wow, isn't that beautiful? No, it turned into a snake, into a serpent. What does a serpent speak of? The serpent always in Scripture speaks of the curse. In the, in the wilderness, God told Moses to lift up his staff, which had a bronze serpent on it, and uh, all those who looked upon it were healed. It speaks of Jesus being lifted up on the tree. Hallelujah. Cursed is he who hangs upon a tree is what the scripture says. That Jesus became a curse for us. That all the curse of sickness and disease was cast upon him. All the curse of the law was cast upon him. And so what God is saying here, yes, it's a, it's a shadow and a type. It's speaking of Jesus and his finished work, that Jesus is the greater Moses. But it's also speaking to another thing. Do you know the, the wonder of God's word is that it speaks to many things at one time. It doesn't just say one thing. It speaks of the multifaceted or manifold wisdom of God, many-sided and so what we have here is this picture of the curse that is in the work. The curse that is in your work. The curse that is around you. Do you hear what I'm saying? How many of you have encountered the curse 
at work where you try hard and people are trying to undermine you. Pastor Jenny spoke about it this morning. Some of you in your workplace, there is things going on in your workplace where people are trying to sabotage your work. They're trying to undermine the work of your hands. What does God say to Adam? Because of what you have done this, you will bring forth uh, uh, thistles and thorns through the sweat of your brow, speaking about how God had cursed the earth. So when we look at this whole picture here, and we see the serpent in the garden, we see the serpent on the rod, and now we see the rod turn into a serpent, what's God speaking to? He's talking to His people about the fact that He has the power to overcome the curse. In your work. That's why he says to Moses, now pick it up. By what? By the tail and not by the head. Nobody picks a a snake up by the tail. Why? Because it'll swing around, it'll bite you. So it takes great faith to obey God. To say, now pick it up. Pick it up. By the wrong end. In other words, God's saying, don't try and control the effects of the curse that are on this world through the works of your own hands. He says, I will take care of the business end of the snake. You just pick up your rod. You pick it up and know That because you've yielded in my presence, and as you pick it up again as something that is consecrated. Do you know what consecration means? It means for narrow use, separated as unto the Lord, for the Lord's use. So when you talk about yielding your career, yielding your skills, yielding your gifts, yielding your ability, yielding your talents unto the Lord, and then you pick it up again, the Lord is saying, I'll take care of the curse on your behalf. Can we give him some praise in Jesus' name? That's why yielding your will, your agenda, your stuff into the presence of the Lord is so important. It's so important. But the thought that I have been given, I believe, by the Lord regarding your hand and what is in it is bigger than just yielding it to the Lord. There comes with this a very important thing about identifying what is in your hand. You need to know what the Lord has given you. You need to know what the Lord has given you. You need to be able to recognize it and not despise it. You need to be able to recognize it and say, okay, God, you've given me this. There's a limitation to it. Everything that you want in your life, hallelujah, hasn't yet happened. You do not have an unlimited sphere of influence. You have a metron. You have a metron. Come on, say, I have a metron. Okay, now you have to ask me a question. Pastor, what's a metron? (laughs) I'm glad you asked the question. A metron is your limited sphere of influence. Paul addresses this, and he says to, uh, to, to the church, he says, you should not boast in another man's labor. You should not, in other words, you should not take credit for what belongs to another man's work. There is a sphere of influence that the Lord gave to Paul, and there's a sphere of influence that the Lord gives to you. That's why even uh, uh, the, the, the psalmist King David said, and the boundary lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. In other words, there were boundary lines of the limit of his sphere or metron. You have a limited sphere or metron. That's not to limit you. No, no, no. This is the wonder of what God does when you recognize the limit of what he's put in your hand. When you take the limit of what he's put in your hand and you submit it to God there and you identify what it is, 
God begins to move what is small and insignificant from a natural thing into a supernatural thing. That's why the Moses' rod turned miraculously from just an implement or a tool in order to get a job done into something far, far greater. But it was still a limited thing. Look at what happens in the Scripture. Again, to just uh, illustrate this even more. Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. Speaking to his disciples, he says this, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have, so they recognized they had something, right? They identified what they had. They had to search for it. They had to seek for it. But when they recognized what they had, listen to what their attitude was toward what they had. It says this. It says, we have here only. Everybody say only. Go, only. Have you ever felt that way? I've only got this. I've only got that. I've only got this influence. I've only got this is the attitude that comes from smallness. We have only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. You got to recognize the smallness of what is in your hand first. You've got to identify it, but hopefully without an only attitude. Then you're going to see again another. You see, God uses the little before the miracle's done. It's what's left at the end that makes the miracle happen. Okay? You look at the woman who has no food left in the middle of the drought. We spoke about her last week even. She's a widow. She has a son. She's starving to death. And what does the the Scripture say concerning this widow in the time of Elijah in 1 Kings 17, 12? And so she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Here's the word again. Only a handful of of flour. What's that in your hand? I got a, all I got, Lord, is a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. Can you see? That's before the miracle starts. A dried up stick in the, in the hand of Moses. A few fish and a few loaves of bread in the hands of a disciple. A little bit of flour, a handful of flour. And a jar full of oil, hallelujah, in the hand of who? Of the widow. Some of you are saying, Lord, I've only. The reason people say only is because they are looking at what they have in their hand to be the sole answer for what they need in their life. You will say only when you look at what is in your hand to be the supply of what God wants in your life. And that's why the spirit of only will come upon your heart. I say to you, no, the Lord has a greater plan. The Lord has a greater plan than the only. The second thing I believe we need in order to be faithful with little is this. We need to value what we have in our hand. You've got to identify it, and now you've got to value it. The problem with us valuing what we have in our hand is that we find a scripture in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10, and it says, For those, for who has, it says this, for who has despised the day of small 
beginnings. I've got my hand up. Who, who, who's ever despised smallness? A small startup. Small what? Bank balance. Hallelujah. Small influence. Okay? It's easy to despise small. Our, our human condition is, is bent toward despising the little thing. But what God does is He values the little thing because it's the little thing that gives Him a platform to display His glory. If you are already glorious, you're, you're, you're taking some of the glory away. God doesn't want you to be absorber of the glory. He wants you to be a mirror that reflects His glory. You're a mirror. You're not an absorber. Hallelujah. And so the Lord, the Lord wants to help you this morning value the smallness so that you can be faithful with the little so that He can give you much. If you can't be faithful with the little because you don't value the little, or because you have not identified the little, then the Lord can't take you to the final step. And the final thought here is that we need to ask the Lord to show us the opportunity that is hidden in what is already around your life. It's already there, Carol. It's already there, Jenny. Come on, it's already there, Faith. It's already there, Omega. It's already there. It's already in your life. Everything that you need for life and godliness, you already have it. So when you pray and you say, Lord, will you please bless me with such and such and such and such, he will answer the prayer by showing you what's already in your hand, and then he will go beyond that, and then he will show you that you need to value the smallness of the seed that is in your hand so that he can allow you to see the opportunity of what lies in your sphere. There are opportunities, and you can't see them right now because you're looking for something to happen. You're waiting for something to happen to you. It's not about what's going to happen to you. It's about what God is going to show you is already there. The world says in order to be different, you've got to think outside the box. God says no to thinking outside of the box. God says think inside the box. Before God did the miracle of feeding the 5,000, he didn't go and bring a massive catch of fish. You mean because he, we know he can do that, right? We already see that miracle. Well, so why didn't he just send one of his guys out, you know, and to have a massive catch of fish? No. God used the little that was there, and he multiplied it. God used the little flour that was there and the little oil that was there, and he multiplied it. God used the stick that was already in the hand of Moses, and he transformed it. God even used the jawbone of a donkey that nobody ever wanted or saw the value in to slay thousands of Philistines through the hand of Samson. Everybody wants the donkey because they see the value in it. But when the donkey's dead and it's rotten, nobody wants it. And even less do they want the bone of the donkey that's baked in the hot Middle Eastern sun. Bleached and white. Until one day, hallelujah, the Lord revealed the insignificant to the great man. Yeah? Yeah? And God used the insignificant to do the significant, that he might get the glory. God has chosen the foolish things of this world 
to confound the wise. So if you're a bit foolish, you're a perfect candidate for God to use you. Hallelujah. He's not looking for the noble, the Bible says, or for the worldly wise. He's looking for those who have abandoned those things and have come and have thrown their skill set, their ability, their influence, their knowledge, their resource at the feet of Jesus. And in that moment, there will be a turnaround. And the turnaround will come from recognizing opportunity. Come on, say opportunity. Someone wise once said, opportunity doesn't knock twice. Actually, it doesn't knock at all. But stands silently next to a problem waiting to be recognized. I like that because every upgrade and every opportunity I've had in my life has come in the form of a problem. Oh, I was single. For me, that was a problem. (laughs) Hallelujah. And God brought Jenny into my life. Hallelujah. Problems of, of not knowing how to break through to the next level. And God says, oh, you're looking for an outside silver bullet answer. I am your silver bullet, says the Lord. You know what? And God is the one who then enables you to see. Even the world understands that they don't credit God. They credit uh, nature, mother nature. So what they say is, uh, something is the mother of necessity. That's right. How, how, why is it? Exactly. There was a great need. There was a problem. There was no light, and we were using candles, and somebody decided, hey, man, let's change the whole burning houses down scenario and all the messy wax. Why don't we make a light bulb? There was a need. So always there's a need. There's a need. There's a need to communicate. There's a need to connect. There's a need. Business people, don't chase money. That's an outcome. Money's an outcome. Bring something the world needs to serve the image of God. Why does God love cities? Because that's the highest uh, uh, density of His image. You want to you 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 believe God for increase? Find something. You have, see an opportunity, hallelujah, to serve the image of God by what you bring. And the money will follow you. You will not follow the money. People will beg you for it. There will be cues. There will be people asking, oh, there are people in this church that are bringing value to Africa through solar power. People in this church that are bringing value to Tembisa, Alex, Soweto, Deep Sluit, through bringing medical, affordable medical solutions. Don't have to worry about money. Money cometh in Jesus' name. So what am I saying to you this morning? I'm saying to you that the Lord, when you pray and you say, God, I want 2018 to be a different year, a better year, He is going to begin to show you, number one, what's in your hand. He'll reveal what's already there. And then He's going to make you want to ask Him. You're going to have this need to say, Lord, show me now the opportunity that surrounds me. And I bet you it's going to look like a problem already in your life. But there's an opportunity sitting right there in the problem. Hallelujah. All right. So I want to show you a, a video clip to illustrate this. When somebody said some, says something so well, there's no point really in saying it yourself, right? You must let them speak. I want to show you something Bishop T.D. Jakes said, because it's so right on for what I felt to say this morning, watch this little clip. 
So I'm in South Africa and I'm on a safari and I, I'm, I'm, I'm really like tripping off of this safari and I'm out here with all of these big animals and stuff. And I notice the elephant is moving around. The elephant is strong and he's big and he's tough and his power's in his weight. And he throws his weight around. And he throws his weight around. What can you do with him? Because he's so big. God made him big as a defense. The lion roars. When he roars, everybody is almost paralyzed in fear. Because God gave him his roar as his defense. The cheetah says, I can't roar like that, but I can run like the wind. The cheetah he goes running through the woods because God made him able to run because that's his defense. The eagle spreads his wings and soars into the air and says, I can't run, but I can fly. God let the eagle be able to fly because it was his defense. And I'm walking around in the jungle and I said, well, Lord, I can't fly like the eagle. I can't run like the cheetah. I can't roar like the lion. And I can't throw my weight around like the elephant. What did you give man as his defense in, in the whole ecosystem of human, of, of life force? What did you give me? He said, I gave you a brain. Your brain is your defense. That's why God didn't make chairs. He only brings it halfway. Mm -hmm. And then let you imagine, collaboration, create, develop. Do you understand what I'm saying? The problem with church people is that we are taught that God makes furniture. So we pray and 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 pray. A table, I need a table. God, give me a table. Give me a table, Jesus. Just one table, Lord. If you give me a table, I'll praise you. If you give me a table, I'll serve you. And God says, I don't do that. I make trees. I want you to look around your life for trees, not tables. God's going to bring it within the reach of your mind and your creativity is going to take it the, the rest of the way. And Come on now. You see, he's right. He's right. We pray and we pray and they're powerful prayers. We'll do all my prayer for a pair of shoes. When God says an actual fact, what I want to do is give you an opportunity to create something. But because we despise the smallness in our hand, we never move to that creative place. We're constantly complaining or moaning or putting our hope out that God will do something outside our sphere in order to make us succeed. Something that he's going to do outside and he's going to bring it into our sphere. No. The Lord has everything around you already. There are two things that have always enabled me to move to the next level. Number one, God showing me an opportunity. And number two, God bringing the right person into my life. And they've usually already been in my sphere. God will answer through people. God will answer through people. I have walked with the Lord long enough to know that God uses His image to help His image. God will use. You are His image. You are in His likeness. God is going to use somebody to have a conversation. Somebody who's maybe just five steps further down the road of what you're building. Going to give you a glimpse. Going to help you to see the tree. Going to help you to see what they're carving out of that same tree right next to yours. And you're like, wow. Me? I, and then the next thing you know, God's starting to show you the value 
of the tree in front of you, instead of you despising the smallness of the tree, you begin to recognize the power of what can come out of it because God gave you creativity, the same creativity that is in Jesus Christ that created the heavens and the earth, hallelujah, the galaxies and all of the universe. Come on now, that same spirit that raised Jesus out of the grave is the same spirit that's living inside of you and that same spirit wants you to rise up and to begin to recognize with the eyes of illumination and revelation that the answers are already around you. So we need to stop complaining about what's not there and start asking the Lord to show us what is there. You believe in the lie of the world to keep looking outside of the box, my friend? You'll be looking outside of the box for the rest of your life. The answer is in the box. Come and say, in the box. In the box. Come on, in the box. It's already there in Jesus' name. That's how God works. So stop looking over the wall at somebody else's vineyard. Stop looking over the wall at somebody else's success. Stop looking over the wall to find an answer from over the wall. No, it's inside the field. It's inside the field. It's inside the field. It's right there. God will show you. God will show you. Hallelujah. Shall we pray into this right now, church? I think we should. Why don't we stand and, and, and pray into this because it's true, it's right, it's on point. It's what the Holy Spirit's saying. It's what you've been asking for. Some things that have been eluding you, steps forward. Hey, you've come a long way, but you still got a long way to go. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate how far you've come, but let's also, hallelujah, believe that the best is yet to come. Let's believe the Lord that what he, he did to get you to where you are. He will enable even greater to get you to where He's taking you. God didn't take you out to leave you in no man's land. No, God is taking you through. God is taking you to the other side. God is taking you on a journey. God is not lost. God is not confused. God is not in double-minded about you. God is certain about why He made you, why He put you on the earth right now, why He gave you your parents, why He gave you your passport, why He gave you your education, why He gave you your gifting set, why He made you a man and not a woman, why He made you a woman and not a man, why He gave you those desires, why He gave you that creative chip, why He gave you everything you got, why He gave you your nationality, why He gave you your language, why He gave you the color of your skin. No, 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 no. You will not disadvantage because God does not disadvantage His kids. You are right on time. You are right on time. You are right on time. we got to stop believing the lie that we are somehow hamstring. No, 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 no. Your limitation, hallelujah, in the presence of God is not limitation. It is Holy Spirit power to bring glory to God. The bigger the limitation, the more opportunity for God to do something magnificent. Hallelujah. You got some big challenges? You serve a great big God. I love it when that man said, quit telling God how big your mountain is and start telling your mountain how big your God is in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that the Lord is putting His finger on your heart right now. He's going to show you. Let's pray. Say this with me, Jesus. I know the answer is staring me in my face. It's in my field. It's in my sphere. It's in my box. Show me. Show me. Show me. Show me. And help me to accept the smallness when I see it. Help me not to be proud and to disregard, to despise, to say no. Lord, I want to say yes. Give me the grace. Give me the humility 
to see it and to build with it, to submit it in your hand, in your presence, and believe you to show me the opportunity, the opportunity, the opportunity that is hiding in a problem. Show me, show me, show me in Jesus' name. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah.